I'm Brian Dickinson, and this training bite is on virtual methods and classes in System Verilog. This is the sixth in a series of training bites showing you how to use classes in System Verilog. And in this bite, we're looking at virtual methods and virtual classes that can help us resolve issues around method access in polymorphism. So if I have a look at an example here, I have three classes base, parent, which is a subclass of base, and child, which is a subclass of parent. And all three have the implementation of a simple method IAM, which tells us which type they are. I can declare handles on these three classes, and I create an instance of parent in the handle P1, and an instance of child in the handle C1. And we saw in the previous byte on polymorphism that I can take that parent instance from P1 and copy it into the base handle B1. But if I call any methods off B1, then these methods are resolved according to the handle type. So B1.IAM is always executed in the base class, even though B1 contains a pointer to the parent class. And this also works for my child class. I take my child class instance and copy it into the parent handle. I call p1.iam. This is implemented according to the handle class, so we're executing the implementation in the parent class, even though the p1 handle is pointing to a child implementation. So this feature means that if you have a subclass instance in the parent class handle, you can't access the members of that subclass. Now we could fix this by using casting, but there's a much easier solution, and the solution is to use virtual methods. So we declare a method as being virtual simply by putting the virtual keyword in front of the method, and virtual methods are resolved according to the contents of a handle, not the type of a handle. So again, if I take my parent instance in P1 and copy it into B1, if I now call B1.IAM, well, I still go to the base class first. We still look at the type of the B1 handle. That's a base class. We go to the base class to execute uh, IAM. When we get there, we find out that the IAM method is a virtual method. That forces us to go back to the handle, look at the contents of the handle. We see that there's a parent instance inside that handle, so we redirect the call to the parent class, and we execute the implementation in the parent class according to the contents of the handle. And this works also for our child class. So again, p1.iam, this will first go to the parent class. When we get there, we'll find that the method is a virtual method. We'll then go back and look at the contents of the p1 handle. We'll see it's pointing at a child instance. So we'll direct the call to the child class and execute the implementation iam of the child class. So now we can access the members of a subclass instance when it's held in a parent class handle. You can access the methods by declaring them as virtual, and you can access the properties by accessing them from a virtual method. Now, when we declared the IAM method in the base class as being virtual, it was automatically virtual in the parent and the child class. So the virtual keyword on the IAM implementations in parent and child is actually optional. Once it's declared as virtual in the base, it's automatically virtual in any subclass. So you can omit the virtual keyword, although you may want to keep it there for readability. So when a method is accessed of a class handle, which method do we actually implement? So first of all, we always go to the class declaration of the handle type first. And if we get there, if the method is not virtual, then we execute the implementation we find in the handle type. So here, when I call b1.envert, I will jump to the base class first. When I get to the base class, I will find out the method is non-virtual, so I'll execute the implementation that I find in the base class, even though b1 contains a pointer to an instance of the parent class. If, however, we get to the handle class and we find that the method is virtual, then we go back and look at the contents of the handle. If the handle contains a subclass instance, then we direct the implementation to the subclass type. 
So here when I call b1.vert, I will first go to the base class, the handle type. When I get there, I find out that the function is virtual. So this pushes me back to the call. I'll look at the call itself. I'll see that b1 contains a pointer to a parent instance. So I'll go to the parent class and execute the implementation of vert from the parent class. If, however, the handle doesn't contain a subclass instance, so there's actually an instance of the base class in the handle b1, then we direct the call back to the base class. But at least we looked at the contents of the handle to work out what was there. So virtual methods lead us on to another feature in System Verilog called a virtual class. And a virtual class is a class where we have the virtual keyword in front of the class keyword. And this means that this class can only be inherited, it cannot be instantiated. It's also known as an abstract class. So here I can put a handle on the base class, b1, but I can't call a constructor of a virtual class. So here calling the constructor on b1 is a compilation error. Now a virtual class, and only a virtual class, can contain pure virtual methods. And this is a prototype of a method, so it's the first line only without an implementation. And this tells us whether it's a task or a function, what the name is, and also the number and type of the arguments. And if we extend from a virtual class that contains a pure virtual method, then we are forced to provide an implementation of that pure virtual method. It's a compilation error if you don't provide an implementation inside of your subclasses. So the idea now is by extending all of our classes from the base class, we know that we must provide an implementation of I am, and that means we can safely call the I am method from any subclass of base. So this training byte had a quick look at virtual classes and virtual methods. In the next byte, we'll have a look at randomization, and the last byte in this series, we'll have a look at constraints for randomization.